Uh, I want you to know that we're going to talk uh, about a subject that gets pretty intense, and I want to send as a reminder that this series is a from this day forward series. So I'm not here to bring up your past. I'm here to set you up for your potential, your future. Uh, I, I, I'm a, I serve a forward-facing God that has good plans and good hopes for you. This isn't me shaming you for your past, because I know we all have things in our life that if, if we were in that moment right now, we would feel guilt and shame. But my Bible says that there's no longer shame or condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ Jesus this morning, you're good. So this is to set you up for your future. And uh, if you have a middle schooler or a teenager, this is going to help them so much. And uh, I, I really hope that uh, you take some time to lean in today. I actually teach this in our new resource that my wife and I just released called Kids Without Lids. It's for parents. And you can... Uh, yeah, every first-time family gets a copy when they check in their kids for the first time. But uh, I teach this because I think it's so important to teach kids what God's plan is for purity. And this sermon is titled, God's System for Sinless Sex. God's System for Sinless Sex. Did you know that having sex is not a sin? <laughs> the way God designed it? In 1982, First Lady Nancy Reagan, she uttered three words that we're all going to remember because it's going to bring back nostalgia. When a, school, when a school girl asked her if someone offered her drugs, do you know what those three words were her answer? Come on, you know it at all of our locations. What did, what did she say? Just say no. You know it. It's ingrained into who we are. It's, been, it's like implanted into our brain. It's, it, it's in, from the 1980s to the 1990s. Now, decades later, st studies are showing that when you teach people to just say no, they, it actually causes them to uh, pique their curiosity even more. So then they're like, why, why are they keeping stuff from us? What are they not telling us? Why aren't they sharing with us the truth? And it, if anything, the more kids heard the statement, just say no, the more they became interested in the things that they weren't allowed to see or touch or do. And so what secret do they know that they don't know? What, what fun are the adults keeping me from by telling me to just say no? Now, the same research is being done on the culture that I grew up in, which is the purity culture. Right. I don't know if you, you grew up in purity culture where we just didn't talk about it and it was never addressed. And what it does is it sparks curiosity because the church doesn't address it. Right. What's fascinating to me is why the church doesn't address something that God designed. Right. It wasn't the world's idea, by the way. Right. Sex is God's idea. Right. And so when you're told you know, no sex, sex is bad, sex kills. If you have sex, you're going to die. Well, obviously you want to know more about that. And that's why I'm trying to help give some freedom today by talking about sexual purity and God's system for sinless sex. Because God created sex for our enjoyment. I'm going to say sex a lot. So if you're uncomfortable now, you'll be uncomfortable over the next 26 minutes for sure. God's first command was for mankind to have sex. Did you know that? Like, I'm just following the Bible, preacher. Yes, you are. Genesis 1.27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. I'll just stop right there and to stop any confusion that you might have in this day and time as of the time of this recording, we believe that God created two genders and two genders only, male and female, he created them. It's a strange world that we live in that I have to tell you what kind of church you're at, but we believe that in Genesis 127 that God created two genders, and then this is what he said for them to do in, in, in chapter 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, come on somebody, and increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. Now God could have made kids happen any other way, but he desired for us to actually uh, participate together with intimacy in order for children to be produced. So let's pray today and ask God to teach us his system for sinless sex. Father, we love your word. It's clear. It can be awkward at times, but I'm not worried because you've called me to teach people what the word says and not what the world says. 
So today I don't stand on my opinions or my ideas. I stand on the promises and the faithfulness of your word. Your system works and I just pray that we would use it. Pray that we would turn from our sin if there is anyone in here living in an unrepentant, sinful lifestyle of any kind. That we would do your system for sinless sex. In Jesus name. I don't know if you ever had the question before, like, where do babies come from? Ever had to answer that question? And you say, my belly, for a long time, until you can no longer say my belly. And then you, like, have to explain to them. And God designed it to be in such a way that uh, he wanted the greatest thing we would create, which is our offspring, to be the byproduct of the greatest pleasure he would ever give us here on earth, which is sex. Let me, let me read it in how I wrote it in my notes. God designed it to be that the greatest thing we would ever create is the byproduct of the greatest pleasure he gave us. Yeah. How, how good is God? Very. That out of the greatest pleasure he gave us here on earth, which is sex, we would also get the greatest thing we would leave here on earth, which is our children. Yeah. Now, sex is a good thing. I have to clarify this because a lot of times people get really weird. And, and, and God is a good God. <laughs> And God created sex. And he knows the only context for healthy, enjoyable sex is the context of marriage. Right. Marriage is a covenant. I have to define marriage. I don't know what kind of world we're living in, but <laughs> great-grandpa is rolling around in his grave. Right. I had to define that there are only two genders. Now I have to define marriage for you. Marriage is a covenant where both parties are committed to one another for life before God and man. And this is why in the next chapter, Genesis 2, 24 and 25, this is why a man leaves his father and mother to be united to his wife and they become one flesh. Verse 25, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. How awesome is that to live in a sinless society where even clothes were optional? Because there was no shame and no guilt and no sin. They didn't know any better. But here's what I know. What God creates after the fall of man, Satan cheaply imitates. Satan is the chief of confusion. He is the father of lies. He is the king of the counterfeit. So when God creates worship, Satan counterfeits it with idolatry. When God creates commandments, Satan counterfeits it with legalism. When God creates love, Satan counterfeits it with lust. When God creates community, Satan counterfeits it with gangs and cliques and isolated communities that won't allow people in. When God creates prosperity and resource, Satan counterfeits it with materialism. When God creates dogs, Satan counterfeits it with cats. When God created real intimacy within marriage, Satan will try to counterfeit it culturally with cheap sex. That's right. That's right. Cheap sex is sex with no commitment. Yeah. Right. Cheap right. sex is sex outside of covenant. Yeah. Right. Cheap sex is easy sex. Yeah. Right. And he wants to tempt you outside of everything inside of God's plan. I hope I'm setting some people free today at the south side, at the west side, and at the east side. This is why Proverbs 5.15 addresses it. I love it so much. He says, drink water from your own well. <laughs> Share your love only with your wife. Why spill the water of your springs in the streets having sex with just anyone? What a great analogy. That we each are given a well. We each are given a, 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 a place where it is designed to be. And you have an option. Do you take it in the streets? Or do you take it under God's design? See, there's two, there's two things. There's, there's a sex that fulfills God's way. And there's a sex that spills in the streets. <laughs> there's a sex that fulfills God's way. And there's sex that spills. I hope young people are taking notes today. This will save you regret, heartache, so much uh, baggage that you might bring into your marriage if you realize that there is a sex that fulfills 
and a sex that spills. What's the difference between a sex that is fulfilling and a sex that is spilling? It's very simple. The order. There's an order to things. There's an order to everything God has ever designed. When God puts things in order, uh, it's the right way. He knows exactly what he's doing. When he puts things in order, he knows exactly what he's doing. And I would say this, God's order, it's perfect. He's got a good order. And when you do things God's way, it will be fulfilling. When you don't do things God's way, as some of you already know from from your past, you know that there will be regret, guilt, and shame. And it's not because of uh, uh, God trying to say, I I don't want you to have sex. God's trying to say, I want you to have sex, but in my order. You know, there's a right way to order and a wrong way to order. Whenever you go to the drive-thru, there's a right way to order a Starbucks. There's a wrong way. I'll take venti, hot, cocoa, my white mocha latte. The lady's like, what is that? And then they'll repeat it to you in the right order. Have you ever, have you ever had that happen to you before? Yes. Like, I, I hear what you're saying, but it's in the wrong order. So this is the order of the drink that you're trying to get. Yes, that's it. Why? Because they know the order that the drink is made in. God is the sex barista. <laughs> and he understands the order at which it's supposed to be made in. And when you understand his order, you look at everyone else and they are out of. And when you are out of order as your pastor, it's my job as the shepherd of this house and the priest of this home to correct things that are out of order. And if I don't tell you that you're out of order, then I will be held accountable to God for what I might not have said to you from his word. Then it's on me. I'm not about to let you go to hell on my watch. So God's system for sinless sex. What is it? What is God's? Tell me God's system, Pastor. I'm going to help you today. First things first, first, God's system for sinless sex is you can be successful, single, and secure. You can be successfully single. You don't need a man to help you accomplish the things that God has called you to accomplish during your single time. Singleness is not a sin. Singleness is not a curse. As a matter of fact, we're going to learn from someone who was single about sex. His name is Paul. He did a lot for the kingdom of God. Never married. You can be single. Successfully single and secure. What's the next step? Well, the next step is you date with the intention to marry. You date with the intention to marry. Why are you dating? I'm dating because I'm looking for a spouse. I don't date with the intention to hook up. I don't date with the intention to shack up. I don't date with the intention to get a green card or to get immigration status. I date with the intention to marry. I'm looking for a lifelong partner. I'm not dating with the intention to hang out or to have fun. I'm looking for who God has called me to live with for the rest of my life under covenant relationship. So what's the system? Successfully single and secure. I'm good. I'm becoming the one, like we talked about last week. Next is dating with the intention to marry. That's why kids, when they're dating at 12 years old, I'm like, what are you doing? (laughs) Let's start with a job. How about about a a, a learner's permit? How about you get an A on your report card before you look for a bay on your Instagram? (laughs) Pastor Michael said something to the youth on Wednesday night. They're in a relationship series. If you haven't got your kids to youth group, you need to get your kids in youth group because it's the only place where we're teaching biblical principles to the next generation. What did you say about breaking up and divorce? What was it? What was the point that you made? Every time you break up, you're practicing for divorce. That's what he said. He, that, that's the truth. If you get used to it, then you'll just think when you get into marriage, you can treat it like you were dating. I like that. That's good preaching, dude. I might have you preach that one of these weeks for the series. <laughs> Dating with the intent to marry. Okay, next thing is married. Woo, praise God. Amen. Now, marriage is forever. Not temporary. And I know where the divorce rate is at inside the church and outside the church. I'm fully aware that at this stage 
in our church at this size. There are many people who might be on their second or even third marriages. But from this day forward, from this day forward, from this day forward, marriage is forever. That's God's system. That's God's system. I'm single. I'm successful. I'm secure. I date with the intention of marrying. Then I get married. Hopefully, I have a job by then, a good credit score, maybe some responsibilities. And then you get to have sex exclusively in marriage. And you get to have lots of it. As much as you want. Really, as much as she wants. This is God's order. I want you to see the whole order on the screen. I think they'll put the whole order on screen. Uh, Then you get to multiplication and stewardship. I put stewardship on there because some people, uh, they might not be able to have uh, physical children biologically, but they can steward the children in their church. They can steward the cousins, the aunties, the, the, the nieces, the nephews. I'm not talking about just having children, but you do. You are called to multiply and steward. So you can be successfully single and secure. You can date with the intention of marrying. You can get married. Then you get to have sex exclusively in marriage and then multiplication. Come on, somebody. I don't like math, but I like that kind of math. <laughs> multiplication and stewardship. So if you came in here today, and, 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 and just let me help you, if, if you're living with someone today that you're not married to, you're out of order. I, I, I'm, I'm here to help you. You're out of order. And you have to, you can correct that order by your actions. That's by moving out, couch surfing for 60 days, 90 days, whatever it takes, and then getting married, or tomorrow morning when the courthouse opens, you go straight there and you say, I'm ready, I've made a commitment, and I'm going to make this commitment for life. Right. Now, don't just run to the courthouse if you're like, I don't know, I just met her you know, on Tinder last week. You know? <laughs> just move out. I'm, I'm here to help you. And this isn't me trying to shame anyone that's living outside of that, but if you're having sex outside of marriage, you're out of order. Right. You're out of order. And despite changing norms and perceptions, premarital cohabitation still appears to be a risk factor for divorce. This is from an article from 2019. This is what the quote says. Across all years examined in this study, the odds of divorce were 1.31 times higher for women who cohabitated prior to marriage. So this try it before you buy it uh, mentality doesn't work. It actually leads to more divorce. 30% chance higher of divorce. Why? Because the order is wrong. The order is wrong. And the thing about sex is that physical intimacy makes a great pinnacle for a relationship, but a very poor foundation. Your first date, it makes a poor foundation. And this is opposite of what the world and culture is teaching. That's why it gets quiet at times, because I'm, I'm literally pushing back against everything that the world teaches you. Your, your, your dad might have even said, yeah, son, go ahead. You're, you might have, you might have a group friend, friend group that's encouraging you to do things out of order. So I can bring correction to the order that's God's way. Now let's look at Paul. Paul's a single guy, by the way. So we're going to get advice from a single person. And I think it's important that a single guy was teaching us because he had to practice being single in a world just like ours, full of temptations. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. I have the right to do anything you say, but do not... But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for the food. God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. What do we have to look forward to? We have to look forward to that these mortal bodies will no longer be our temple, but we will be in the presence of God one day. But until that day comes, we are constantly fighting the lies of the enemy. We are constantly fighting battles in the flesh. Here are three lies that we believe, especially as it pertains to sexual immorality and sexual purity. uh, Number one, the first lie that the world tries to tell you, the devil tries to whisper, if it feels good, do it. That's a lie. If it feels good, do it. No, 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 no. A lot of things feel good that you should not do. 
I love Krispy Kreme. If it feels good, do it. How many dozens? I just say, put me on the conveyor belt. I get to lead? No way. I want to be anointed and I get to eat. If it feels good, do it. That's a lie from the enemy. Not everything that feels good is good for you. Your body desires pleasure. Your flesh is drawn towards sin. Your flesh is drawn to your old nature. Your flesh man will always try to surface, but your spirit man needs to be in charge. My body craves things that would bring pleasure to it momentarily, but would kill it forever. Amen. Sleeping with people you know are dysfunctional, taking substances that you know create habits, addictions will kill it. So you need to not believe the lie that if it feels good, do it. The second lie that you need to not believe, young people, and this is for everybody because, you know, I'm realizing I, I got out of youth ministry because I didn't want the drama, and the drama multiplied when I got into adult ministry. I'm like, man, I, I, thought, I thought it was just teenagers. The second thing is this, is I can handle it. I can handle it. That's a lie. You can't handle it. We can't handle stuff because it will master us. Uh, you, you live with the idea that you can handle all this stuff, but it takes down the best of us. How many of you know TMZ and Christian Post, they're looking for pastors to fall? So I'm not here to tell you that I can handle it on my own. I'm here to tell you that I've set up systems that allow me to pre-decide not to fall into temptation, as should you. Amen. So the three lies that we believe is the first one, if it feels good, do it. The second one is I can handle it. No, you cannot. You need a support system. You need the presence of God. You need the pursuit of holiness. You need the pursuit of righteousness. Amen. And the third thing, hear me out at all of our locations. I love you so much. This is out of love. This is out of love. The third lie that we believe is it's my body. It's my choice. My body, my choice. Well, the enemy wants to lie to you that it's your body and it's your choice. And if you believe that, you can have that right, but it's my job to teach you what God's word says. Yeah. See, I'm not a life co coach that champions your bad ideas. <laughs> I'm here to preach the truth. <laughs> I'm a pastor that speaks God's word. Yeah. My job is not to tell you what you would like to hear, but what you need to know. Yeah. It's not your body because it was purchased by God through Jesus Christ on the cross. My body doesn't know what's best. God's word does. If my body got what it wanted, I would, I'd be 500 pounds. God knows what's best, but if you do it your way, you end up feeding something that ends up killing you. So it's not your body, your choice. God purchased your body with his son's body on the cross. And so I am subject to his lordship and to his rule and to his reign. It's not my body. It's not my choice. My body is a sacrifice before the Lord. It's a holy temple used by him to do the works of the ministry that give him glory, not me glory. So no, it's not your body, not your choice. Golf claps at everywhere, but that's okay. It's especially true when it comes to your sexual appetite. Sexual sin over promises on fun, but it under delivers on fulfillment. So how do we walk in victory? I'm so glad you asked. You always ask good questions towards the close of the message. You always ask the apl applic applicable questions. How do I do this? Well, I'm going to give you four keys to fighting sexual sin. Now that we know God's sinless system, now how do we fight sexual sin? This is for everyone at all of our locations. Number one is don't believe the lies. Don't believe the lies of the world. Don't believe the lies of culture. Don't believe the lies that you've been told that you have to try it before you buy it or that you need a high body count to be successful and strong or that you need that app to bring fulfillment or that you need that because you're a man and you need to, you have, your, your needs need to be met. Don't believe the lie. Paul calls this out in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Paul is good, man. Paul's doing the preaching today. Hear me out. If you've made a decision to put your faith in Christ, you are saved and your spirit is going to heaven. You are eternally secure in Jesus' name. But your flesh will take some time to catch up to the reality that your spirit is eternally secure. So it's not your spirit sometimes that you need to keep in check. It's your flesh. Well, isn't all sin the same 
Isn't all sin the same? Lying. No, sexual sin is greater. Here's, I'm, I'm, this passage goes on to tell us that sin does not just affect our own body, but it affects the bodies of those around us. And at, I would present that it affects the generations beyond us. So some sin is internal. It messes with our soul. Other sin messes with our soul and it's external, the, external, the souls around us. It's a big deal because the solution to our sin is the same, but the gravity of our sin differs. Nobody wants to hear that today. See, when Christians sin, it doesn't affect our salvation, but it does affect our significance. God, why isn't he using me? It's because you're living with her. Why isn't he using, why can't I do more for God? Because you're living in an unrepentant lifestyle. You're not repenting. I'm not saying that we all haven't sinned. I'm saying that those who do not repent of that sin will lose their significance. And they, 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 they won't lose their salvation. You're eternally secure. But I want to let you know, God will only use those who are holy, righteous, and leaning towards him. As a Christian, when we play with sin, we lose our blessings. Because my purpose is tied to my purity. I can't go where you go. I can't go where they go. I can't go every place that I'm invited to go to. Why? Because my purpose is tied to my purity. And I know that if I go there, I'll be tempted in one way that would actually void me of being able to be used by God in another. All right, number two. You got to keep sex within your marriage. It seems very simple, very uh, traditional. The, the TikTok uh, version is trad wife or trad life, a traditional wife, traditional life. But this is what we live by. We don't live by trad life. We live by the Bible life. And if you're not married, you cannot have sex. I don't know how much more plain I, I can. You cannot have sex. If you are married, please have lots of sex. It keeps you out of the counselor's office. Number one question we ask whenever we do marriage counseling. We're having a hard time in our marriage. When's the last time you were intimate? It's interesting that the frequency of intimacy is directly correlated to sometimes the struggles that you have in your marriage. It's not the only solution. I'm not saying there's not real baggage and real spiritual weights that, are, that maybe came into the marriage from your past. But intimacy on a regular basis really helps with that. And some of you are too busy. Some of you need to have more downtime, more margin with your spouse. You need to go, and you don't even need a vacation. You've been saving up for a, a, a $4,000 cruise. Just go to the Holiday Inn right here. Just go to North Hills. There's a Marriott right there. It's a nice Marriott. Paul keeps the challenge going. He keeps, the, he keeps the challenge going. Verse 16, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in her body? Be careful who you have sex with. If she's, not, if she's not your spouse, it makes her not your wife. Paul calls it something different. I'm trying to be really nice to you. For it is said, the two will become one flesh. So anyone you become one flesh with that's not your spouse, it's technically what Paul said. It's up there. Underneath the 16. Okay. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. God's plan is for there to be one spirit, one flesh. The picture of two people being united together, sealed. Proverbs 15, 18. May your fountain be blessed. And may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. You're supposed to get married. And you're supposed to be with that person since your youth. You're not. I know God gives you second chances. And I know God redeems the time. But God's desire is for you to. Whoever you marry is forever. Yeah. Sex within God's order brings pleasure. But sex outside of God's order brings pain. If you're married, you need to make it a part of your relationship. You need to put it on your calendar. You need to schedule it. I'm, I'm thankful for the youth ministry. You want to know why I'm thankful for the youth ministry? Because on Wednesday nights, I get to drop off all three of my children. My house is empty on Wednesday nights. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. I feel the presence of the Lord. Can it be Wednesday yet? 
And I pay, I pay Donovan Ford $20 to bring them home after youth group so I don't got to leave the house. <laughs> Best $20 I spend all week. Say, hey, you, go, you bring the kids home? Yeah, I bring the kids home, Pastor. Praise God. Why? Because I get the house to myself with the wife of my youth. Praise God. Number three. Try not to embarrass her too much. She's over there. Number three. Don't just fight sexual sin. Flee from it. Flee from it. We don't just fight it. We flee from it. We don't go into battle that we don't want to fight. That we don't need to fight. If you struggle with alcohol addiction, stop going to the bar. You know? If you, if you struggle with, with one night stands, stop going to the club. You know? Don't be like, I'm going to be strong. I'm, I'm just going to order water. No. If you're on a diet, you don't go to Krispy Kreme. You know, you can't. We don't, we don't fight things that we're supposed to flee from. In 36 years of life, I've never lost a fight. You want to know why? Because I've never had a fight. Can't you tell? I wouldn't know what to do with my hands. I don't go into places where I'm expected to fight battles that I'm not supposed to fight. Some of you have put yourself in situations and you're like, I'm just with her alone at the apartment for six hours at a time. You're putting yourself there. Flee from it. 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 6, 6, 18 says this. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. See, it's, it's not because you're not strong enough. It's because you're not wise enough. You're just making dumb decisions. Can I just level with some people in here? You're just being dumb. You're just being dumb. This is what I wrote in my notes. Many people fall into sexual sin, not because they lack the willpower, but because they lack the wisdom. You just need wisdom. The Bible says, half-brother of Jesus, James, says, if you lack wisdom, ask for it. Ask, ask for it. Ask for it. Number four, you got to rely on God's power and God's people to sustain purity. The piano player can return. you got to rely on God's power and his people to sustain purity. Verse 19, don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Woo! Your body is not your own. Hate to break it to you. It's not your own. This is where God's spirit dwells. God's spirit dwells here, not my own. We are carrying the Holy Spirit in a body that sometimes does things that don't line up with the Holy Spirit's desires. And I know it's tough. I know it's tough. I was a teenager. It was so tough to fight sexual temptation. We got married young to not fight the sexual temptation. I wanted to get married at 18. Her parents were like, one more year, please. I had already bought the ring, the, oh, the, the biggest ring I could afford. They said, one, please wait one more year. I said, okay. I took the ring back. One year later, I had more money. I got a nicer ring. That's why they told me to wait a year. Because I showed them the ring. They were like, not enough. As a missionary kid ring, we need you to have a J-O-B for a little bit. Bought a, bought a nicer ring the second time around. They said, you can marry our daughter as long as you wait five years to have children. No problem. We have a five-year plan. That's standard. At 19, you should wait five years. Five months later, Ariana. We were expecting Ariana. Sorry. But we were practicing what we had been waiting to practice while we had dated since we were 14. Making up for lost time. That's what us homeschoolers do. I know it's tough going through a divorce. I, I can only imagine what it's like to be, be, be a blended family or a single mom or a single dad today. 
I don't, I don't know that personally, but I know that that's many of your testimonies. And I just want to let you know, uh, lastly today, what God requires, his spirit empowers. So he would not require you to live a certain way that his spirit has not empowered you the ability to live. He will not give you a battle that his spirit has not empowered you to fight. He would never throw you into the lion's den without the power to shut the lion's mouth. He would not throw you into the fire without the power to send a fourth man in the fire. He would not, he would not allow you to be hungry on the hillside without the power to multiply bread and loaves. He will not give you things that you cannot handle. What God requires by the power and by the presence of his Holy Ghost, he will empower you to live free to live single, to live secure, to live pure, holy, and righteous. What God requires, His Spirit empowers. I want to see you set free. I want to see a church on a trajectory towards purity, holiness, and righteousness. I want to see marriages strengthened. I want to see children live their entire teenage years without falling into temptation and to present their bodies to their spouses pure, holy, and blameless. When you get me, you get all of me. My desire for my children and your children is that when they get married, they would look across the aisle and they would say, when you get me, you get all of me. Nobody else has had a piece of me. No one else has ever. I've never poured out my love physically to anyone else. That's why it's possible It's not easy, but it's possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't let the world try to convince you that it has to be their way. You can do things God's way. Let's pray today at all of our locations. Father, I pray that your spirit would empower us. Married, single, divorced, young, old, doesn't matter, God. I just pray that your spirit would empower us, God, that we would be empowered by your Holy Spirit. We will be empowered by your Holy Spirit this week to set aside the addictions, to set aside the substances, to set aside the environments we go to. We would do things your way. Lord, I thank you for purity and holiness and righteousness. Not religion, not pharisaical mindset, but a person that lives led by the Spirit. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. That's what your book says. So we ask that you would lead us by your Spirit today. I pray for boldness to correct anyone living in an unrepentant lifestyle, that you would somehow, some way, make a way for them to correct their actions and to do things your way. I pray for protection over our children as they go into the world, as they're, everyone's on their devices. I pray for exposure to things on the internet to be ceased in Jesus' name. I pray for you to protect their minds in Jesus' name. Redeem any sin in Jesus' name. Forgive it, oh God, in Jesus' name. Your, your, your blood will wash us white as snow in Jesus' name. I pray for a pure, holy, and righteous church that is set apart because we do things your way, empowered by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen. Let's clap our hands for God's word today at all of our locations.